We are a nation hooked on pills and medicinal quick fixes. Our health service spends billions of pounds on drugs that we might not need. But the last decade has seen a surge of research into an alternative approach to health, the use of food as medicine. Now these studies from around the world will be shared with the public by the Food Hospital. The first of its kind, it's dedicated to combating illness through food. Pioneering this approach are three medical professionals with 40 years of NHS experience between them. I passionately believe in the science of food as medicine and I want the public to know about it. They want us to stop reaching for the drugs. When we get ill, we think it's much easier to pop a pill than it is to alter our lifestyle. It's time to change that thinking. And start eating our way back to health. Each year I operate on hundreds of patients who are ill through poor diet. But food isn't the enemy. It could even be the cure. Over three months, the food hospital will treat patients with conditions ranging from high cholesterol to cancer and from infertility to eczema without prescribing a single drug. Every year, the NHS spends nearly £2,000 for every person in this country, but this could be massively reduced by treating people with diet. The food hospital prescribes an individual plan for each patient's condition. A mother and son whose lives are blighted by psoriasis. You know, got called every name under the sun, you know, spotty, scabby, flaky, you name it. A man with fatty liver at death's door. I'm afraid your life expectancy is significantly shortened, Ian and a singer whose acid reflux could end her career. But the food hospital doesn't just treat patients. Dr Pixie McKenna searches for the truth about the things that claim to be good for us. Today's supplements contain not just vitamins and minerals, but a whole host of other ingredients. But what is the scientific evidence behind the benefit of these vitamins? First, at the food hospital today, are a mother and six-year-old son suffering from an incurable skin disease that affects a million people in the UK. My name's Karen Lowe, this is my son Callum. Both of us suffer from a skin condition called psoriasis. The most of it is actually on my tummy. It's itchy and I would like it to go away. Symptoms of this inflammatory disorder include swollen and scaly patches which spread over the whole body. There are many causes, including stress and throat infections, but a third of psoriasis cases are affected by genetics. In our family, Callum is now fourth generation, so he's got it, I've got it, my mum's got it, my granddad had it, my great aunt had it. Karen and Callum's lives are ruled by a punishing regime of medication. Callum's case is so severe, he has regular visits to Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. The first level you generally try is either creams and ointments. So we can go through a lot of sheets, a lot of pyjamas. We can only use certain detergents anymore, we'll make him itch. Having lived with her own symptoms all her life, Karen is now watching history repeat itself and feels powerless to control it. Callum has got it so much worse than I ever did at his age. Um, you know, got called every name under the sun, you know, spotty, scabby, flaky, you name it and obviously that's something I really wouldn't want Callum to go through. I suppose I feel guilty, especially because I've got it. I feel it's like my fault that he's got it. Hoping for help where conventional medicine appears to be failing, Karen and Callum have come to see GP Gio Mileto. I started with my psoriasis when I was about seven years old. Callum's came out when he was about two, two and a half. Quite. It was actually three. Three. Psoriasis is an inflammatory condition of the skin. Typically, it takes about a month for people's skin to kind of renew itself from the bottom up. Where you have patches of psoriasis, that skin comes up to the top in about three days and falls off. So it's literally 10 times faster turnover. So there's this sort of accelerated inflammatory process going on. These patches most often appear on the elbows, knees and back. They can join together and spread as the disease progresses, covering large parts of the body in unsightly lesions. So can we have a look, Callum, at your skin and see what it looks like? This is typical of guttate psoriasis. And guttate is from the Latin meaning drop, like a teardrop. And it is the one that tends to affect children more than adults. 
Like all food hospital patients, Karen and Callum will keep taking their medication, even if it's not working. That way, we can be pretty sure that any changes are a result of their new food regime, not a change in their drugs. Using the latest research, dietitian Lucy Jones has devised a food-based treatment. So our plan for today is actually to give both you and Callum an anti-inflammatory diet. What I've got here is a bit of a do's and don'ts with psoriasis. So on the left here, we've got some fried foods. When foods are fried, what we get is a lot of omega-6 fats. And what those actually do can make inflammation in the skin worse. Karen and Callum must also avoid foods like biscuits, cakes and pizza. These create a rush of insulin, which may trigger an inflammatory response. Instead, they should eat food like oily fish, avocado and nuts, all rich in omega-3, and also certain herbs and spices, which could all help reduce inflammation. Evidence suggests this food plan may also help with eczema, asthma and hay fever. Something we also may need to add in is fish oil capsules because some of the evidence around omega-3 fats suggests that you'd have to eat a hell of a lot of oily fish to actually get enough of them in to make a difference to your psoriasis. But people should always talk to their health professional before starting to add in things like supplements because obviously it's a bit of an unknown territory. This cutting-edge anti-inflammatory food plan is based on recent nutritional research. Lucy hopes that just six weeks of treatment might make a difference, but can a boy of six stick to such a strict regime? I'm really excited to see whether there is any changes. If it doesn't work, it doesn't matter, I'll try anything once. The next food hospital patient is a woman whose life is blighted by involuntary projectile vomiting. My name is Sophie Garner and I suffer with reflux. Affecting nearly a fifth of the UK population, reflux is a condition where the stomach valve at the base of the esophagus doesn't close properly and the acid in the stomach leaks into the throat or even the mouth. This substance is nearly as acidic as battery acid and causes the burning of the gullet. A professional singer, Sophie spends much of her life on the road, eating on the run and enjoying a drink with her bandmates. But 15 years of severe acid reflux is seriously affecting her rock and roll lifestyle. The, the symptoms involve me sometimes literally being sick in the middle of a gig on stage. It is like being exorcist woman without the spinning head. The sensation is burning. If I'm on stage, that's horrendous because the last thing I should be doing then is singing because my vocal cords have been burnt. Sophie had an operation on her vocal cords a year ago to try and correct some of the damage, but it failed to help her and her symptoms have continued. I run the risk of losing my career over it. So the, the stakes are really high for me. Desperate to save her singing career, Sophie has come to see consultant surgeon Shaw Summers. First, he wants to check the damage to her vocal cords. Yeah. The vocal cords are, are coming yeah, together. Because they're inflamed yeah. and they're not able to vibrate that fast. Mm -hmm. There's a tightening at the bottom of your gullet tube that stops the acid coming up. Now, in a lot of people, that valve isn't quite tight enough. Now the acid in the stomach is really strong and it will strip the lining from your gullet. Normally the lining has this nice whitish epithelium as we call it that are the general protective cells of the gullet. The bottom bit here is a darker pink and that's due to constant irritation of the gullet by acid that's coming up from the stomach. Her career may be in jeopardy but in some cases years of reflux could potentially also be life-threatening. And we know that people who have chronic reflux over 10, 20 years are at a much higher risk of developing what we call Barrett's esophagus. And that's the first steps towards developing some cancers of the gullet. Wow. <laughs> I think the need to get on and treat you mm. is actually quite pressing. Mm. Before prescribing a treatment plan, dietitian Lucy wants to show Sophie just how corrosive her stomach acid is. So this glass contains about a pint of hydrochloric acid, which has been diluted to be the exact same concentration as the acid in your stomach. Wow. 
Wow. We actually put an aluminium ring pool in that glass about 12 hours ago. Can you see any residue of it at all? There's nothing in there. Absolutely nothing. Oh. So you can imagine 13 to 15 years of chronic reflux does an enormous amount of damage. And that's going up into my throat. Mm. I, really, I didn't know it was that corrosive. Mm. Lucy thinks that Sophie's lifestyle is aggravating her condition. There can be particular trigger foods. Alcohol is an obvious one. When you do drink wine, how much would you have? Probably a bottle and a half with, between me and my partner. Mm -hmm. There's also about the way you eat. Having big meals and irregularly is quite a culprit. And try to eat at regular intervals through the day. However, that needs to stop mm. about three hours before going to bed. Wow, that's going to be hard as a singer. Gosh. If you suffer from reflux or even occasional indigestion, these changes may help. Lucy now wants to address what damage the acid has already done with a cutting-edge treatment plan. There's actually quite a lot we can do in your diet to counter that oxidative stress that's occurred in your oesophagus because of the chronic reflux. Brilliant. Lucy's antioxidant food plan will arm Sophie with ingredients to help prevent any further cell damage. Antioxidants found in vitamin C, E and beta-carotene have the potential to cancel out the damage done by oxidative stress. Foods rich in these antioxidants include orange vegetables, leafy greens, berries, nuts and whole grain foods. If you have reflux, you should avoid alcohol, caffeine, fatty foods and red meat, which are all low in antioxidants. This means a significant change in Sophie's eating habits, so Lucy gets started with an easy recipe. This is basically an antioxidant-rich spinach and feta salad. Vitamin C-rich cherry tomatoes are roasted with garlic. Now, the reason we're using raw broccoli rather than cooked is because of a certain type of nutrient called sulforaphane. Now, this is quite a powerful nutrient in repairing that cell damage in your esophagus and being anti-cancer. Sunflower and pumpkin seeds and avocado are packed full of vitamin E. And spinach is full of beta-carotene, which can counter cell damage. So would you like to have a taste? I'd love to. Great. Evidence suggests that a diet rich in antioxidants may ward off many cancers. <laughs> you approve? I feel quite shocked, actually. And the scientific experiment, that's blown me away. The fact that acid can do that in 12 hours to nothing. I'm going to stick to this diet fully. Later, Shaw takes Sophie into theatre to assess the damage to her gullet. But what will his microscope reveal? Big swallow for me. Swallow, Sophie. Well done. The Food Hospital has worked with over 200 experts and 50 research bodies to bring together some of the latest studies on food treatment plans. Our team, consultant surgeon Shaw Summers, GP Gio Maletto, and dietitian Lucy Jones, are ambassadors of the Food as Medicine movement. What we eat has a direct effect on our health. Food is also medicine. The next Food Hospital patient is a man who suffers from an ailment that may affect a quarter of the UK population. My name's Ian Fernley, and I've come to the food hospital because I'm suffering from associated problems with being overweight. One of the main problems is what's called a fatty liver. This is a disease which is fast becoming a 21st century phenomenon due to our carb-heavy Western diets. Fatty liver has symptoms which can include tiredness, generally feeling unwell, and upper abdominal pain. They seem fairly harmless, but this disease is a silent killer. A disease caused by diet alone, Ian eats 5,000 calories a day, as much as an Olympic rower. See you later. Bye, bye, love. Sure. What do you want for tea? Uh, whatever. Okay, I've got a couple of meals in. All right, then. See you All later. Bye-bye, right. sure, Susan. Diagnosed a year ago, he's always struggled with his weight, recently hitting 25 stone. I think it's the simple things, really, you know, like being able to, to get off the settee even, you know, he does struggle to do that. Ian has two daughters who share this concern. I'm worried that, you know, he might not, this sounds horrible, he might not live as long or something like this. My biggest fear is death, that I'd 
leave my family. So it's time to change. It's time to change for me and my family. And I'm not losing them, so bring on the fight. As the symptoms aren't obvious on the outside, Shaw starts by showing Ian what's happening to his body on the inside. Well, fatty liver is a condition where the liver just can't cope with the amount of calories that are being put its way. A normal sized liver is sort of purpley coloured. If you've got a bit too much fat in the liver, it goes this yellowy colour and that's what you would typically see in foie gras. Yeah. The goose liver where they force feed geese so that the goose's body can't cope with the calories and it puts down liver fat. The liver releases energy derived from food into the bloodstream to be used by the body so it can function normally. Eat too much and the excess converts to fat and is stored in the liver, making it swell up and become dysfunctional. Since the liver does over 500 jobs in the body, including destroying toxins and combating infections, if it stops working, it will kill you. That excess fat in the liver causes the liver not to work correctly, and eventually it becomes what we call fibrotic. The liver just becomes gnarled and knobbly. If, like a quarter of us in the UK, you have a body mass index of 25 or over, you could be at higher risk of fatty liver. With a BMI of 46, Ian is morbidly obese. Measuring the liver's size is a useful indicator of how far the disease has progressed. So Shaw has arranged for Ian to have an ultrasound scan at the food hospital. The liver is enlarged down to the level of your rib cage, and because you're a big fella, that means it's, it's a fairly chunky liver. If Ian continues on this path, ultimately his liver would get irreversible and potentially lethal cirrhosis, which is when scar tissue stops the liver working properly. So Ian, you have a fat mass of at least 50%, so in other words, half of your body weight is fat, and that really is a significant amount. Now, if we look at your blood tests that we have done, you can see that the different levels of certain enzymes in the liver have started to rise, which means the liver is unhappy. And unless we really get to grips with that over the next year or so, I'm afraid your life expectancy is significantly shortened, Ian. Okay. The future doesn't look too bright at the moment to me. Okay. Um, and to lose my children and my, and my wife, not be with them would be just catastrophic. Ian's fatty liver is caused by his bad diet and poor nutrition. And rather than use medication to cure it, I'd like to see if a total overhaul of his nutritional needs can reverse that. To reverse his fatty liver, Ian must lose weight. When you go on a diet, the liver quickly unloads the energy that has been stored there and begins to shrink. Lucy wants him to adopt a low GI food plan to speed up this process. GI, or glycemic index, is a scale which measures the effect of carbs on blood sugar levels, and Lucy has a demonstration of why this diet accelerates liver shrinkage. The whole principle of this is that high GI foods burn quickly, and the same as the energy you're going to burn quickly in your body, where lower GI foods should burn more slowly. So we've got two different types of cereal here, one high GI and one low GI. Okay. Lucy is comparing a crisp dry cereal to a high fibre bran one to show how slow burning foods are better for us. What this is going to demonstrate is just how quickly the body can burn up the energy in these foods in your body. OK. So we're starting to get some smoke. And what we can see is that the crisped rice cereal is very clearly on fire. Yeah. And the bran-based cereal is burning much slower. We've got some smoke from it, but no fire. It's quite a difference, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Absolutely. So high GI items that Ian should avoid include starchy foods that burn quickly like white bread and rice. Instead, he needs to concentrate on low GI fruit and vegetables, pulses and whole grain foods which burn more slowly. But it's not always obvious which foods to eat and which to avoid. There's some really stark differences in these. Jacket potatoes and mashed potatoes, where they're cooked really well and you get that fluffy bit in mm -hmm. the middle, breaks down almost as quickly as sugar. 
Right. So it's a super high GI where new potatoes, for example, have a much lower GI, particularly when they're still quite hard when you eat them. So your body has to work harder to break those down. As well as promoting weight loss, his low GI food plan will also give Ian more energy. So Lucy's going to show him how to make these dietary changes with an energy boosting spaghetti bolognese. What's gone in so far is a range of vegetables and oil and some lean mints. Okay. We're going to add some green lentils and some red kidney beans. And that really helps to reduce the GI profile. Whole wheat spaghetti burns more slowly than white, making it low GI. One of the really good tricks is to reduce the amount of pasta and to boost up the protein section, and that will help to balance the whole GI of the meal. That's really tasty. Yeah? Ian will get a whole new eating plan, which he must follow for the next 12 weeks to try and reverse his dangerously fatty liver before it's too late. The diet that I learnt with Lucy was really eye-opening. I thought it was cut out everything and hardly ever eat again, and it's just changing them different types of foods that you eat. The next visitor to the food hospital is a teenager with a rare but distressing ailment. My name is Rihanna Ash, I'm age 16 and I'm from Hampshire. Rihanna suffers from periodic bouts of hair loss, called alopecia. I've had it since I was four years old, but the patches have grown back and then come in different places. And at the moment I've got it at the back of my neck, but it hasn't grown back for about a year now. My biggest fear with the alopecia isn't so much the patch that I've got right now, it's more the fear of it getting bigger or if I go entirely bold. 12 years of living with hair loss has meant increasing levels of worry for Rihanna. Going through her teens with these problems has been difficult, you know, and she's had GCSEs to do at the same time. It's been a lot for her to go through. There's a lot of peer pressure to look good. I don't know if I might lose my friends because I don't look as nice or if, like, boys don't fancy you because you've got bald patches. Alopecia areata affects around 60,000 people in the UK and is generally acknowledged as a disease of the immune system. The exact cause is unknown, but can be linked with genetic factors, vitamin or zinc deficiencies, and sometimes stress. It's terrifying, because you just think, is this the beginning of her losing all of her hair? It's very difficult, particularly for a girl, um, because your hair is your crowning glory. Desperate to reverse her hair loss at this crucial stage in her life, Rihanna has come to see Gio Mileto. So your hairline is quite high up, isn't it? Yeah. And this is, might be where it would end normally, mm -hmm. but instead it's right up here, yeah. sort of a good few centimetres up. So I'm going to do something called a pull test, right, which is to gently pull the hair, yeah. see if anything comes out. OK, well, I've got a few hairs there. It seems a little bit looser than you'd normally do, because if yeah. I pull it up here, for example, nothing's coming out. Yeah. Right on the edge here, they're kind of, the hairs are falling out like they're kind of ripe fruit, yeah. almost, to be honest. If Rihanna's condition is due to a zinc deficiency, it could be addressed with dietary changes. But her blood tests show that her zinc levels are normal. Also, there's no family history of alopecia, ruling out a genetic link. So now Geo must explore other avenues. Well, I've always had bad stomach problems, but it's got worse within the last year. Do you get any bloating? Yeah, after I eat, I do get bloated quite a lot. I call it my food baby. <laughs> OK, and, and it's a bit personal, but do you get sort of diarrhoea or yeah. constipated? Yeah, um, get diarrhoea quite a lot. So putting everything together, the symptoms that you've got, the story that you give, and examining your abdomen, it does seem possible that you might have irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. Although there's no link between IBS and hair loss, Geo has identified a common factor. We know that stress makes IBS worse, and stress can potentially affect autoimmune problems, which is the kind of hair loss that we think you have. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that looking at these two things together could potentially improve them, but I think what we need to focus on probably with diet is your stomach symptoms. Yeah. There is no known food cure for alopecia, but Gio and Lucy have decided to try a food as medicine first, they're going to treat Rihanna's IBS, which they hope will lower her stress levels, which could be the cause of her hair loss. So Lucy is prescribing probiotics to see if they can manage both conditions. Probiotics are actually bacteria that naturally live in our gut. 
We have good bacteria and we have bad bacteria. And if the balance falls off and we get too many bad bacteria, it's linked to a lot of conditions. Some evidence from clinical trials show that Rihanna might benefit from a specialist probiotic thought to relieve the symptoms of irritable bowel syndrome. The one we need you on is called Bifidobacteria infantis 35624. And what we're hoping is taking it over four weeks might actually improve your gut symptoms, alleviate the diarrhoea, hopefully help some of your stomach pains. That might be really helpful in terms of getting you better. <laughs> Although the link has never been made before, Lucy and Gio hope that by tackling her IBS, Rihanna may see an improvement in her main issue of hair loss. It's three weeks since the food hospital gave Karen and her son Callum their anti-inflammatory food plan and fish oil supplements to try and help the psoriasis that was making their lives a misery. But a big dietary change isn't easy to incorporate into family life. On the diet I was given, I have to have half my plate fruit or vegetables. It sounds really easy, but it's, it's not so bad of evening meals. She just had extra vegetables, but I said breakfast is definitely the hardest. Karen has come up with some sneaky tactics to get those helpful spices into Callum's favourite foods. Turmeric has an anti-inflammatory property. And if I stick it in here, and because it's yellow, it mixes in perfectly with the eggs, and they don't know. There you go, scrambled up. I think I've accepted a long time ago that there is no miracle cure out there, despite people offering me every lotion, potion, cream under the sun. But even just taking a symptom away, such as itching, would be the huge relief. I'm Dr Pixie McKenna, and each week the Food Hospital sends me to investigate claims about food and nutrition. Today, I want to delve into the science behind the modern health phenomenon of food supplements. Today's supplements contain not just vitamins and minerals, but a whole host of other ingredients like herbs, amino acids, fibre, fatty acids and enzymes. Vitamins and dietary supplements are a huge growth market, with sales reaching over £670 million in 2009. But what do we think they actually do for us? Omega-3... Oh, I can't even think. You never took a supplement. No, I don't need to take supplements, do you? No. Because it's all about it... it what's the word? Uh, taking vitamin supplements is probably a good idea because a lot of people don't get enough nutrition. If you take too many vitamins, they can poison you, I think. Omega-3 helps your brain develop. Helps your brain develop. We buy them because we think they help us improve our memory, keep us working at our best and help us stave off colds. But what is the scientific evidence behind the benefit of these vitamins? Later on, I meet a nutritional physician to find out. There's a real mismatch, actually, between who's taking supplements and who needs them. When Sophie came to the food hospital, she was worried that her acid reflux might end her singing career. You watch my every move. But 15 years of suffering might have a more alarming consequence, an increased risk of throat cancer. Consultant surgeon Shaw Summers is performing an endoscopy to get a detailed picture of any damage. What we're planning to do is a special test for Sophie to see what kind of problems have happened as a result of her reflux. I'm going into this with a sense of trepidation. Um, I'd like to think that everything is okay, but if it isn't, at least I will know. Having this procedure really puts a lid on everything for me. It tells me where I'm at and what damage it's, it's done. Just give in to the feeling and just go all woozy. It's thinner than my finger, and that's just going to go the same way that the food goes down. Right, Sophie, I'm just seeing the back of the vocal cords there. Big swallow for me. If there's a lot of damage, Sophie will need an operation on her faulty stomach valve, which is letting the acid up into her throat. So we're looking down Sophie's gullet now, going down to the bottom. It actually looks pretty good here. Wow. Okay, just going down, nearly finished there. All done. 
Lovely. It all went very well, okay? You have a slight looseness at the bottom of the gullet, which I think is allowing the acid to come up. Well, the good news is everything looks as it should do. There's no signs of long-term damage to the gullet. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay. I'm so pleased. Good. Well done. Anyway, Thank you. I'll see you back at the food hospital, all right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Currently, Sophie's stomach valve doesn't need surgery, but now it's up to her. She'll have to follow her food plan rigidly if she wants to save her throat and her career. It's eight weeks since Rihanna came to the food hospital with two seemingly unrelated conditions, IBS and alopecia. Now she has returned for her final consultation and Gio wants to know if his experimental probiotic food plan worked on either or both conditions. You've been on a food supplement for your irritable bowel syndrome. How have your symptoms been affected? I have still had some pains, but it doesn't last as long as it used to, and I don't get them as often as I used to. How long did it take for your symptoms to improve? I think it was about a week, and then I just stopped taking them last week because they ran out. OK. And I noticed that my symptoms got a lot worse once I stopped taking them. That's actually quite an interesting kind of observation. Yeah. So basically, when you ran out, you stopped taking them, obviously, and the symptoms came back. Yeah. So it's a good sign that they're having a positive effect. The fact that Rihanna's symptoms only returned when she stopped her treatment helps to prove that it was probiotics that improved her IBS, not just chance. Gio and Lucy also hoped that alleviating her IBS might have a favourable effect on her alopecia. We thought maybe if your stress levels improve because your IBS improves, your hair might too. So what's happened there? I have regrowth. OK. Yeah, so I noticed it about a couple of weeks ago because I was just fiddling with my hair and it felt differently. So I asked Mum to have a look and she said that there was little hairs coming back, like baby hair. Let's take a look, shall we? Yeah. So you're talking, if we look at the hairline here, here's sort of a curtain of new hair covering what was previously a really bald patch. So that's new hair growth? Yes. That's very exciting. Yeah. So you're feeling better and both conditions have improved. So it's a fantastic result. I'm very pleased for you. We use probiotics to treat Rihanna's irritable bowel symptoms and that's something that's fairly established medicine. The alopecia treatment was a bit of a long shot, a bit of creative medicine, but I'm very glad it turned out for the best. I'm Dr. Pixie McKenna, and I'm investigating the truth about supplements. Each year we consume millions of pounds worth of vitamins and supplements in the hope that they will ward off illnesses and disease. But are they really necessary? Vitamin C is the UK's most popular single vitamin supplement, with annual sales reaching around £36 million. I've come to meet a nutritional physician to find out what, if anything, is so special about this popular pill. An awful lot of my patients take vitamin C, particularly in the winter time, because they say it wards off coughs and colds and flus. What's your theory on vitamin C? Well, vitamin C is a, a very important nutrient. It's an antioxidant, it's one of several. They busily mopping up undesirable chemicals that are released as part of our own metabolism or as a part of environmental pollution or as a result of smoking. We can demonstrate vitamin C's antioxidant properties with just some simple corn flour and some iodine solution. The colour change when the iodine is added shows the pollution caused by bad chemicals known as free radicals in our bodies. So here comes vitamin C, a few squirts. When vitamin C is added, the antioxidant properties clear the solution of the pollution. So it's a bit like vitamin C is coming in and it's cancelling that bad debt that you have in your credit card. Yes, it effectively. is. It is. There is some evidence that vitamin C as a supplement, high dose, short term, may be of benefit because it may have antiviral properties and give your immune system a boost. But we have to be differentiate between that and long-term regular usage of high-dose vitamin C. There is now some evidence from the United States that women who are taking high doses of vitamin C, about a gram or more, had a slightly increased risk of breast cancer. So we can't assume that vitamins are harmless. So vitamins can help in both high and low doses in the short term, but may be harmful in prolonged high doses. So should we take them? Earlier, I did a blood test to see if I was lacking any basic nutrients in my system. You're going to live, Pixie. That's good. the good news. Good. And I'm pleased to hear that. Most results are 
average or slightly above average, but one or two are a little bit below the national average. Do I need to get myself out of here and into the pharmacy and buy some Not particularly. There's no real need for supplementation. You should be able to do this all with uh, maybe some minor changes to your diet. Do you think that we've just gone overboard with taking vitamins and supplements as a nation? Well, a lot of people aren't eating that well, and they'd be better off to not waste money on vitamins and supplements, but actually to eat a healthier diet and buy more fruit and vegetables. There's a real mismatch, actually, between who's taking supplements and who needs them. The people with the worst diets are not the people taking supplements. It's actually the people with the best diets who are taking supplements. So the use of supplements currently in the UK only lowers the risk of deficiency by about 1%, according to National Diet and Nutrition Survey data. However, there are some people who do need supplements, including those whose bodies can't absorb enough from their diet through illness, all pregnant women, and people who drink and smoke a lot. So supplements may be useful for some, particularly those with deficiencies. But for the rest of us, if we are eating a healthy diet, then taking supplements isn't going to make us extra healthy. Running in cottage cheese. Oh, oh we we'll do a bit of eggs. chicken, oh, char grilled chicken and stuff that we buy. Oh, that's quite nice. Because yeah, it's like not that. as fatty, yeah. is it? Since the food hospital delivered Ian some home truths about the effect his fatty liver was having on his life expectancy, he's been forced into making big changes at home. I was told about the liver disease, I was told about my bloods and my life expectancy and there were three key things that really shocked me. It made me realise the implications of, you know, what could happen if we didn't tackle this problem. Ian has introduced exercise into his life and is trying to stick to his low GI plan prescribed by the food hospital. Charlie! My diet is unrecognisable, really. Fresh fruit, vegetables, snacking on the right foods. My portion size has gone from this size down to this size. Twelve weeks ago, Ian was staring permanent liver damage in the face. Now he's returning to the food hospital to see if his food plan has been enough to reverse his fatty liver and improve his life expectancy. And you can see actually that's really nice, that's gone down. Comparing the images to the scan we previously did, we can see that there has been some reduction in the fattiness of the liver uh, and certainly in the size of the liver. So it would be classed as a normal scan. There you go, Ian. Your fatty liver has regressed you now have a more or less normal liver and that's reflected also in the blood tests where there's a resolution of all those abnormalities that you had in the liver tests and all the other ones that were slightly out of whack are now really coming back into the norm. And if you can keep that going, you will be a very different Ian. I, I plan to be a very different Ian. Congratulations, you've done really well. We're proud of you. Wow, I feel really good. The news I've just received is absolutely fabulous. I'm over the moon. I didn't realise how big of a change within such a short period. I'm not doing huge amounts of change into my life, really. Ian's case shows that with a modest change of diet, you can achieve impressive results. Now, for Ian, that's meant his fatty liver has gone away and he feels fitter and healthier. I can't wait to tell Barbara. She'd be so pleased. Six weeks ago, Karen and Callum's lives were plagued by unsightly, itchy psoriasis. Now Lucy and Gio want to know if their anti-inflammatory plan has provided any relief. How are you doing? Well, we're doing really well, actually. Both of us have seen an improvement, which is great. Your arms look a lot less uh, they inflamed. Are, they're flatter. Which is good. Then you know, not raised at all, because normally when they're raised, that's when... I find, for me personally, they really itch. Once we had the, the fish oils, definitely, that's when things kicked what, in. What did you find um, helpful about the fish oil supplements? They just, just didn't make me itch as much. But even more than her own discomfort, Karen had been worried about the effect of psoriasis on six-year-old Callum. Do you itch as much now? Nope. Good answer. Let's have a look at it. It looks so much better. It's a it massive does. improvement. It is. It's phenomenal in such a short space of time. It yeah. Is. These are the white areas here where you, it was all red and inflamed, isn't it? The good psoriasis. And now, let's just have a look. It's all gone. 
The improvement in Callum's psoriasis has been so great that he's even been discharged by Great Ormond Street Children's Hospital. It must make such a difference to your quality of life, just not always itching. I was really sceptical at first, I'll be honest, but I am actually blown away, especially with Callum, with the results. Psoriasis sufferers naturally see a variation in their symptoms throughout the year, but Karen and Callum have noticed almost an immediate effect, both in decreasing itching and also their skin smoothness. That's a fantastic result and hopefully will make their conditions much more manageable for the future. Twelve weeks ago, singer Sophie came to the food hospital with acid reflux so severe that it threatened to end her career and could eventually have led to throat cancer. Now Lucy wants to know if her recommended lifestyle changes and antioxidant food plan have stopped her projectile vomiting. So, how have you been? Fantastic. Um, just free of reflux. So no symptoms at all, that's really great. Mm. Tell us about the main things that you've changed. The alcohol's been the hardest. I've had alcohol, but not as much, and certainly not as late. So if I've had alcohol in the gig, I get to a point, I look at my watch and I think, I have to stop now because we're now so many hours away from me being at home and going to bed. Um, and I'll make pita bread salads and take them on gigs. Excellent. And watch the rest of the band eat rubbish. But it means that you're eating more regularly, I therefore. am. I have breakfast. I never had breakfast. Fantastic. Mm, Excellent. Been great. And have you picked out any triggers particularly? Fizzy. Drinks. Anything fizzy. <laughs> yeah, and chocolate as well. So if anyone comes to you with chocolates and champagne, you're sending them <laughs> off with a flea in their ear. I'm dreading Valentine's Day. <laughs> Forget it. Flowers. <laughs> Lots of flowers. Can't yeah. eat them. No. <laughs> Twelve weeks ago, Sophie was struggling to hit the high notes. <laughs> That is far better than the squeak or squawk that I had That's fantastic. You know, previously. Clearly there is no need for surgery. No. And so for you, I think that's a really positive outcome. It is. This is truly been one of the best things I've done in my life. It's such a brilliant outcome. I'm so yeah. impressed. It is. I could sing it from the skies. <laughs> I'm really pleased for Sophie. She's used food as medicine and managed to completely resolve her symptoms. So not only does she feel better, but she's prevented herself from getting into trouble with severe reflux and potentially needing an operation. So all in all, a great result.